During this seminar, I'd like to explore a little of Australia's carnivorous plant flora with you. I researched carnivorous plants before joining the Melbourne Gardens and continue to work on their taxonomy now. These plants have taken me on some of the greatest adventures of my life, so they're certainly a group I hold close to my heart. Now, while most people get the gist of what carnivorous plants are, a little bit of context is always important. So I'll begin by covering some general carnivorous plant history, explain what really constitutes a carnivorous plant, address why plant carnivory exists, and finally outline the types of carnivorous plants found in Australia. But rather than focusing on the mechanisms of their carnivory, which while interesting is the approach that most talks about these plants take, I'll be highlighting some of their ecological quirks, show how they are central to some ecosystems, and show you some of the multiple survival adaptations found in even single genera. Why am I doing it this way? Well, I want to help you to understand why their broader biological value is so much more interesting than the mere curiosity of their weird diets, and why scientists like me go chasing them to the farthest corners of the earth. But first, some history. This is an early illustration of Dianaea, the Venus flytrap. It's not Australian, but it is a plant most of you will recognize, and which some of you may have bought and possibly killed. It was in writing about this plant in 1770 that American botanist John Ellis became one of the first people to publicly suggest that some plants might eat insects. This elegant idea may seem straightforward to you and me, but it challenged the very conventions of our predominantly religion-based understanding of the order of the natural world. In fact, none other than Carl Linnaeus, the father of modern taxonomy, berated John Ellis about his views. In correspondence to John Ellis, he stated, The idea of an insect-eating plant is against the order of nature as willed by God. He even paraphrased the book of Genesis, stating, God designed plants only for sustenance of animals and men, and the idea of plants that can wield power over animal life is blasphemous. Absolutely fabulous. <laughs> Linnaeus actually said this despite having already described six carnivorous plant genera, but he had many explanations for all the dead insects that were found inside them. This back and forth between the observations of numerous naturalists on the one hand and religious doctrine on the other simmered for another hundred years. It was only in 1858 that the issue was really thrust back into the limelight when explorers Sir Hugh Lowe, Spencer St. John and Frederick Burbage ascended Borneo's highest mountain, Mount Kinabalu. High on the flanks of that mountain, they discovered Nepenthes Raja, the largest of all pitcher plants, pictured here with a colleague from Colombia, with pitchers large enough to contain two or three liters of fluid. In a dramatic turn, they found a partly digested rat in one of its enormous pitchers. Hungry plants were once again back in the news. It just so happened that, at that time, Charles Darwin was finishing off his seminal work On the Origin of Species, which he published in 1859. We know of Darwin as a true giant of empirical observation, so the timing of this proved to be a blessing. Given his own interest in hungry plants and their topical nature, Darwin immediately launched himself into investigating carnivory in plants. He did this using Drosera, the sundews. Now, Darwin really loved these things, to the point that he wrote, I will and must finish my Drosera manuscript, for, at this moment, I care more about Drosera than the origin of all the species in the world. Now, think about that. Darwin wasn't at all given to hyperbole, so one gets a real measure of just how enthralled he was by these plants. He continues, But I will not publish on Drosera till next year, for I am frightened and astounded at my results. Now, in an age where speaking an inconvenient truth could be interpreted as heresy in the eyes of a censorious church, his fears were well founded. In the end, Darwin didn't publish his paper in 1861 as planned. He went on to carry out experiments over 15 years in 12 carnivorous plant genera. His observations were so meticulous that he had to publish a book. Darwin's Insectivorous Plants was published in 1875, along with supporting papers written by his friends Joseph Hooker at uh, Kew Gardens 
and American botanist Asa Gray. The trio created a frenzy, and several contemporaries actually denounced them as mavericks and loons in the popular press. However, Darwin's experiments were so carefully executed and critically reproducible that by about 1880, plant carnivory was widely accepted as a legit thing. And to this day, these plants continue to inspire macabre and ghoulish imaginings, and understandably so. The series of uh, comic musings is from a current display at the Plants with Bite exhibit at the Royal Botanic Garden in Sydney. But creative as these may be, the reality of carnivorous plants, while every bit less supernatural than the madness pictured here, is every bit more marvellous for being real. So what exactly is a carnivorous plant? I say that this is an evolving term because it used to be the case that plants were only considered carnivorous if they digested their own meals. But nature rarely cooperates with strict definitions, and our knowledge has come a long way since then. As a result, our definition has shifted to include the following syndrome of features. We consider a plant carnivorous if it can attract prey. This can be achieved through visual cues like refraction of light, deceptive window paneling, or even UV patterns like those of flowers, or through olfactory cues, that is, smells like sweet nectar, honey, or occasionally mustier creations. They need to trap prey, something that occurs in a dizzying range of different ways, which we'll look at shortly. Trapping must directly or indirectly lead to the death of trapped victims. But why do I write with exceptions? Well, some carnivorous plants have evolved beyond carnivory to consume other things like falling leaves and detritus, while others are coprophages and consume the poop of animals, which is brilliant. And finally, three. They have to derive benefit by absorbing nutrients from the remains of trapped prey, such that the nutrients are assimilated into the living tissues of the plant. This, by the way, is falconer's sundew from the Northern Territory. You can see its superficial similarity to the Venus flytrap, and they are indeed in the same family, Drosseraceae, but this is an example of convergent evolution. It's actually reminiscent of what we imagine the ancestor of the Venus flytrap might have looked like. Now, the definition of carnivory used to include the production of digestive enzymes, but we now accept that there are carnivorous plants with no digestive enzymes at all. They have their digestion done for them, mainly by insects, but also by fungi and bacteria, which I'll touch upon later. To address the inevitable question, why did carnivorous plants evolve? We need only look at the places where they are found, that is, their habitats. These plants occur across every continent except Antarctica, in a range of terrestrial biomes, with the exception of the world's great deserts. So, they're widespread in geographical terms, but in biological terms, they're pretty rare. To give you some perspective, there are about 370,000 species of known flowering plants worldwide. Of that number, just 800, or 0.2%, are carnivorous. These occur in 18 different genera that fall into five broad categories based on how they trap insects. Those categories are pitfall traps, produced by the seven genera of pitcher plants and carnivorous bromeliads. These rely on insects falling into the traps for capture. Second, the sticky or flypaper traps, which are produced by sundews, butterworts, and rainbow plants. These have leaves covered in glue, which trap anything that lands on them. Three, snap traps, produced by the Venus flytrap and waterwheel plant. These clamp shut on prey that wander into their traps. Four, bladder traps produced by bladderworts, which effectively suck in passing prey a bit like a vacuum. And five, lobster pot traps produced only by Genlysia from Africa and South America. These plants have hollow underground leaves that, well, act like a labyrinth of death. Animals get lost inside them, die, and are then digested. Who needs science fiction? So, why be carnivorous? The answer lies in every environment that present-day carnivorous plants occupy. Many of you probably know why this adaptation has evolved, so I'll spare you the suspense. The answer is simply soil nutrient deficiency. To compensate, these plants have evolved to extract nutrients from animals instead of from soil, or, in the case of the, the plant shown here, from the faecal material of tree shrews, which are squirrel-like animals most closely related to primates. They simply straddle the pitcher, 
nibble and exudate produced under its lid and defecate directly into the urn below, which is amazing. <laughs> So take a look at the following habitats around the world, all rich in carnivorous plants. This is Kukenan, one of 115 tapuis in South America's Guiana Shield. Tapuis are 2,800 meter high sandstone table mountains. The first one ever climbed, uh, Mount Roraima, was described in 1884 by Everard M. Thurn, its conqueror, as some strange country of nightmares. <laughs> which is which is basically how Victorians got their funding. Now, rainfall is so great atop these mountains that all the topsoil has effectively been washed away to leave a landscape of twisted blackened rock. The mountains are actually referred to as rain deserts because water has washed away everything of nutritive value. As a result, relatively little can survive, yet dozens of carnivorous plants are endemic to many of these plateaus across Guyana, Venezuela and northern Brazil. Peat bogs used to cover significant areas of the southeast United States. They develop over tens of thousands of years to form thick beds of acidic sphagnum peat. This peat is constantly swept by seepage of water, the water leaches out most nutrients from the soil, and the acidity further locks away remaining nutrients such that their bioavailability is extremely low. Widespread sandstone escarpments in Indochina endure pronounced dry seasons when much of the vegetation dies back. This is followed by immense monsoon rains that leave the ground sodden for half the year, stripping the topsoil of nutrients. And finally, we have ultramafic habitats. These are characterized by nutrient-poor mineral soils that are rich in heavy metals like nickel, chrome, and magnesium. They aren't just rubbish to grow on in terms of low nutrients. They're phytotoxic as well, creating strong selection pressures that favor specialized survival adaptations, including carnivory. And this is Australia. This continent is the world's single richest carnivorous plant habitat. This may come as a surprise to some, but based on the habitats we've just seen, perhaps not. This one landmass has over 230 species of carnivorous plants in six genera. The rate of plant carnivory here is four times higher than anywhere else on Earth, and a full quarter of all carnivorous plants occur right here. Their habitats are concentrated in the wettest regions of the continent, partly in the seasonally wet savannas of northern Australia, but overwhelmingly in the temperate shrublands of the south, with about two-thirds of them occurring in the southwest of WA alone. So, 20% of all plant carnivores are endemic to Western Australia. That said, there is no area on this map where carnivorous plants do not occur, including in the Great Deserts. The reason for this diversity is actually quite well known. Over 80% of the surface geology of Australia is composed of mosaics of sedimentary rocks, with soils that consist of sand and rock eroded from this substratum. The severely impoverished soil and only seasonally wet climate have given rise to extensive shrubland habitats, as well as extensive savannas. And while one might expect impoverished soils to exhibit low biodiversity, the opposite is actually true. The highest rates of floristic and functional diversity on the entire continent are concentrated on the poor soils of southwest Western Australia. And the majority of this diversity occurs in the extremely nutrient impoverished Kwongan shrubland. The Kwongan accounts for just a quarter of the area of the southwest Australian floristic region, yet it contains a staggering 70% of the 8,000 plus species known from there, 50% of which are endemic. Such habitats aren't unique to Australia, so why does this region have the highest rate of plant carnivory in the world? The answer is tens of millions of years of climatic stability, with no recent glaciation or volcanic activity, coupled with low soil fertility. Moreover, this low fertility is common across a broad diversity of different soil types, including white silica sands, loams, gravels, laterites, granite, sandstone, as well as clay and peat. Each of these soils exerts a different selection pressure on the plants that live on them, driving evolutionary changes over time. And in the case of carnivores, soil type can even govern the types of insects that frequent the plants, affecting their diets and thence their trapping mechanisms. So let's now take a look at Australia's carnivores. 
Given their abundance here, they featured prominently in the collections made by famous early botanists who worked in Australia. Specimens were sent back to Europe by Joseph Banks and Daniel Solander, who were on Captain Cook's voyage, which landed in 1770, as well as by Robert Brown, who travelled with Matthew Flinders on the Investigator, landing in 1801. Later, in the 1840s, James Drummond settled in WA. He sent back thousands of specimens to Kew and Cambridge for his colleagues William Hooker and Jules Planchon to work on, and these included many carnivorous plants. Unsurprisingly, many species bear the names of these botanical pioneers. I'd like to now show you each of Australia's carnivorous plant genera. I want you to come away with the understanding that these plants aren't just interesting because they trap and consume animals. They are also hosts to endemic organisms, including flies, mosquitoes and moths, but even algae and bacteria, many of which simply can't survive without them. This makes them keystone organisms of some ecosystems. And they're also champions of specialized adaptation, particularly in Drosera, which has one of the highest diversities of different perinating forms of any single genus in Australia. And in addition to, to being pretty tough, they're also extremely sensitive to human-driven habitat change, making them extremely effective indicators for ecological damage. So, of the five categories of <laughs> carnivorous plants, there are four present in Australia, represented by six genera. These include the snap traps, but we don't have the Venus flytrap. Instead, we have its aquatic cousin, Aldrovanda. The bladder traps, Eutricularia, represented by about 70 species Australia-wide. The pitfall traps, represented by the unique Cephalotus, as well as three species of Nepenthes. And the flypaper traps, falling into two genera, Biblis, with about eight species, and Drosera, with 250 species worldwide and 160 in Australia. The first genus, Aldrovanda, is one of the least known carnivorous plants amongst members of the public. This is a real pity, as it has the oldest traceable lineage of any carnivorous plant genus, with a verifiable fossil record that goes back 55 million years to the Eocene, I think that is. And the form of the plant is quite well represented in this diagram from 1891. Aldrovanda is a free-floating, colony-forming aquatic plant that is segmented into wells of carnivorous leaves. It grows in extremely pure, nutrient-free waters from temperate Europe to tropical Africa and e east across Asia into Australia. Despite its wide occurrence, populations are infrequent, extremely localized and rarely large. When viewed side-on, the wells of leaves look like wheels, accounting for its common name of uh, waterwheel plant. From this perspective, it's easy to see how this plant might be related to the Venus flytrap, as each leaf ends in a similar snap trap. But in this case, the snap trap operates underwater, trapping animals ranging in size up to that of mosquito larvae. When activated, the trap snap closed so quickly that they can crush their prey completely. In this instance, the head of a mosquito larva has been separated from its body by trap closure. Trap closure usually takes 0.01 seconds, making it one of the fastest recorded movements in the entire plant kingdom. Now, let's take a look at a basic video of a manually triggered trap. It should loop, giving you a good impression of the instantaneous trap closure. And there you go. Thank you, Alessandro Ferri. One of the reasons trap closure is thought to occur so quickly is to combat water tension. A slower moving trap would simply waft away the water and any prey between the trap lobes. Instead, the rate of trap closure exceeds the threshold speed for this to become an issue, and tiny teeth ensure that any prey is retained. Sadly, Aldrovanda is also one of the carnivorous plant genera most likely to go extinct within one human generation. A tragic end for any species, let alone one so ancient and unusual. Historically, 290 populations were known in Europe. Now only 37 remain. In Africa, it was known from 12 different countries, but only two populations have been confirmed in the last 50 years. And in Asia, it's functionally extinct, having disappeared from Bangladesh, India, uh, Japan, Uzbekistan, while Kazakh, Korean and Timorese populations haven't been reported for decades. Here in Australia, there were 27 records from across the continent, in the areas highlighted in red. Today, only five isolated populations are known, these being situated in the Northern Territory and in New South Wales. 
So why the decline? The answer is mostly human disturbance. This species is one of the most sensitive natural litmus papers for changes in water quality, but especially eutrophication. It seems that only plants in remote areas or those maintained ex situ really stand a long-term chance of survival. A much more widespread genus of carnivorous plants is Eutricularia, which produces bladder traps analogous to the stomachs of animals. These traps can only function in water, so these plants are restricted to either aquatic environments or terrestrial or epiphytic substrates that are wet enough to support films of water around the traps. Many of you may have actually seen Eutricularia without realizing it, since their flowers are quite conspicuous, but their carnivorous organs are held below ground or below water. They occur widely across the continent in wet areas, but also crop up in Australia's great deserts following rainfall events. They are arguably the orchids of the carnivorous plant world, and the 70 species in Australia come in every imaginable shape and colour form, including a group at the uh, bottom right that uh, look like they've won the lottery. <laughs> These plants inhabit wet, sandy soils, even in Melbourne's outer suburbs, um, on rocks along the waterways up in the Kakadu National Park, or float freely in subtropical lagoons. The flowers of Australian species range in size from about three millimeters to, to three centimeters or more in the larger species. But look below their leaves and you'll see the organs that make them famous. Eutricularia have no true roots. Instead, they have modified leaves that act as roots and others that form the bladder traps. These bladders trap microscopic organisms through to things as large as fish fry, as you can see, the traps look like little bags with a trapdoor opening. When this door is closed, the plant pumps out the cavity within to create a pressure differential. Animals that trigger the hairs around the trapdoor cause the door to fling open, at which point the pressure of the water outside the trap forces its way inwards along with any prey. This is a lateral section through a bladder trap captured by laser confocal microscopy by Igor Sivanovich. In it, you can see the trapdoor of the bladder and the hairs that trigger it. Inside the trap, you can also see the cross-shaped digestive glands that serve to secrete digestive enzymes, but also absorb nutrients. There's a couple of um, single-celled green algae here, also known as desmids, which is where things get really interesting. You see, it's been shown that the traps of all Eutricularia aren't just traps. They are homes to complex ecosystems of microorganisms. Some traps even provide fancy living conditions, developing dark pigmentation that warms the internal cavity, increasing the rate of biological processes. In fact, a recent paper showed that bladderworts actively farm microorganisms. They do this by releasing up to a quarter of the sugar they produce from photosynthesis into their traps simply to feed bacteria and fungi. These bacteria and fungi digest algae that grow in the traps, while the fungi even digest cellulose, making these carnivorous plants omnivorous by proxy. You can see a range of different organisms inside the trap shown here. We now know that different bladderworts actually cultivate different ranges of organisms, with about 24 different orders of bacteria identified from Eutricularia so far. These degrade organic matter and produce proteins, while saprophytic fungi like the Ascomycetes break down cellulose. The traps can even contain thousands of protozoans, including an endemic species, Tetrahymena eutricolariae, a predator of bacteria. These organisms are all critical to the release of nutrients for plant uptake. And as if that wasn't cool enough, there's this pretty species, Eutricolaria menziesii. Worldwide, there are five different carnivorous plants pollinated by birds. Four of them occur in Central and South America. The fifth is Australian. Eutricularia menziesii is endemic to winter wet areas in southwest WA. This tuberous bladderwort attracts the western swinebill, Acanthorhynchus superciliosus, a nectar feeder, probably via its red coloration and large spur, which are suggestive of ample nectar. It's an incredible species to see in the wild. We now move on to Australia's pitfall traps, which rely on gravity, trickery of light, and ultra slick internal walls to capture prey. These prey are digested in what are effectively open stomachs. The first of these is Cephalotus, the Albany pitcher plant, which is endemic to a small stretch of near coastal habitat between the Esperance Plains and Margaret River in WA. This range is centered on the town of Albany, accounting for the plant's common name. This remarkable plant is a spectacular example of convergent evolution. 
It looks a lot like the other pitcher plants, but it belongs to a plant group known as the rosid clade. This makes it more closely related to cabbages, roses, pumpkins, and towering rainforest eleocarpus trees than it is to any other pitcher plant. Even so, the different pitcher plants have all hit on more or less the same deadly patterns of gene expression, despite being separated by millions of years of evolution. But what does it mean for Cephalotus to be so functionally similar to other pitcher plants, yet more closely related to your Valentine's bouquet? Well, genetic analyses have found that only a relatively small set of genes need to mutate in order for carnivory to occur, giving rise to these functionally equivalent adaptations. Using just one example, the three different types of pitcher plants shown here all use enzymes to degrade insect exoskeletons. And in all three types, these enzymes come from the very same class of enzymes. This class includes enzymes used by most other plants to fend off fungal invaders. Of course, the cell walls of fungi are made of a substance called chitin, and so are insect exoskeletons. So, the evolution of these molecules critical to digestion in three totally different lineages all arose from similar mutations of pre-existing enzymes that were all involved in the plant equivalent of an immune system. This is pretty incredible stuff. But, be that as it may, my favourite thing about Cephalotus is this. To give some context, we have long known that a range of animals live in the fluids of pitcher plants, including Cephalotus. These include free-swimming copepods and small oligochaete worms, which feed on detritus, nematodes and mites, which are generalist feeders, but there's also two carrion feeders, animals that specifically feed on, on captured prey, these carrion feeders are both the larval stages of different types of fly. The one pictured here is the adult of one of them, Bodysis ambulans. Bodysis is an ant-mimicking ambulant fly. That is, it's a wingless fly that runs around pretending to be an ant. Adult Bodysis mimic a species of Iridomyrmex ant, which happens to be the main prey item of Cephalotus. This image was taken from a uh, recent monograph published about Cephalotus, and it shows how the ants feed the plant. The plant then offers a nursery for the larvae of the fly. The larvae of the fly help to break down the food, releasing nutrients to the plants. And meanwhile, the fly wanders freely amongst the ants without harm by pretending to be part of the family. Now, as I said, Bodysis is endemic to Cephalotus. And unfortunately, this plant, its only host, has undergone catastrophic declines. Cephalotus was assessed by the IUCN as a vulnerable species 19 years ago, partly owing to a lack of good data. Today, we have excellent data, and the outlook is far worse than it was. To throw some numbers at you, Cephalotus was known from 114 historic locations, but fewer than 25 sites remain today some in national parks, but just as many in undeveloped housing lots or on private land. And yet to this day, remarkably, this species is listed by Western Australia as not threatened. Why this is so is not entirely clear, especially given the fact that the majority of its habitats have now been destroyed. Where Cephalotus does remain, it's threatened by out-of-season fires, as well as by unnaturally hot prescribed burns, which can burn away layers of peat accumulated over thousands of years, as shown here. Then there is poaching for its novelty value, land drainage, or even bulldozing for housing. And if that didn't seem dire enough, the southwest of Australia is drying. Last year, a climate modelling study assessed the habitat of Cephalotus under 32 different climate scenarios. It found a decrease in viable habitats under virtually all predicted conditions. In the absence of urgent and tangible management plans, the curious beauty and ecological novelty of Cephalotus and the wingless stiltfly Bodysis will be irretrievably lost to future generations. We now move on to the tropical pitcher plants. This is a group of about 150 species spread mainly across Southeast Asia, with some ancestral outlying species in Madagascar, the Seychelles, India, and on New Caledonia. Nepenthes is present in Australia, but only in tropical Queensland. There are currently three species of Nepenthes recognized in Australia, though genetic work is being carried out to determine whether they are good species or just one highly variable one. 
Whatever the case, as in Cephalotus, these pitfall traps rely on nectar, gravity, and nonstick surfaces to catch their prey. The nonstick qualities of pitcher interiors have already been used to inspire the creation of prototype nonstick materials with the same sort of microscopic structure as the inside wall of the pitchers. Elsewhere, antimicrobial compounds in pitcher fluid are being tested in the fight against superbugs, which is pretty cool. In terms of endemic insects, however, we don't have a lot to go on in Australia, but that isn't the case elsewhere. Across Southeast Asia, we are aware of frogs, crabs, spiders, bats, moths, and mosquitoes that live and breed inside the pitchers. Several of those are known to be endemic. Little, if anything, has been documented from Nepenthes in Australia, but mainly because no one has really looked. To give you just one example of a Nepenthes endemic, during a study in Cambodia, we found pitchers with perforated walls. Looking inside them, we found a range of spiders already known to live in and steal prey from the pitchers, but they weren't the ones who caused the pitcher damage. To see what did, we had to get a little closer. And there you have it. This is an intact chrysalis simply floating in the pitcher fluid amongst the remains of trapped prey. This chrysalis belongs to Ortober rada, a type of moth. Pupae of this moth were first recorded in Nepenthes pitchers in 1926 by a zoologist in, I think it was Singapore. Since then, it's been found in pitchers of Nepenthes in several countries across Southeast Asia. The adults lay their eggs on the outside of the pitcher wall, the caterpillars hatch out and gnaw their way inside. They then become semi-aquatic, prey-stealing carnivores that actually live in the pitcher fluid using it for protection. This image actually took me quite a long time to capture for this very reason, because as soon as these caterpillars perceive movement, they let go of the pitcher wall and drop down beneath the fluid to the very bottom of the pitcher where they find safety. A different example of an endemic species came unexpectedly last year when I was studying a new species in the Philippines. I cut open a pitcher to study its gland distribution and found yet another organism. This appears to be the maggot of some kind of fly. It drags prey trapped by the plant right into the very bottom of the pitchers where it can dine freely. This particular insect has never been documented before and probably represents a new species. And it won't be the last new species found living inside these plants. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and make a prediction. My prediction is this. Whenever some lucky ecologist gets the funding to carry out a proper study of the animals that live inside Australia's Nepenthes, they're going to find something new of at least this order. So watch this space. This brings me on to the last group of carnivores, the viscid carnivores, or those with flypaper traps. Biblis is one of two flypaper carnivorous plant genera in Australia. Although it looks similar to Drosera, the sundews, it's actually from the same order of plants as rosemary, sage, and the bladderworts. Its sticky traps are yet another example of convergent evolution. Most of the eight Biblis species occur in Australia, with a couple known from Papua. They range in an arc from just south of Perth, north to the Kimberley, and east to the Northern Territory and tropical Queensland. Like Drosera, they trap prey via a glue produced by stalk glands on their leaves. Digestion then occurs through secreted enzymes right on the surface of the leaf. However, one species of Biblis, the critically endangered Biblis gigantea, is also a host to myriad bugs from the genus Cetochorus. These are Cetochorus biblophilus. These animals are kleptoparasites, so-called because they steal food captured by the plants. They consume them by sucking out the prey's innards using sharp needle-like mouthparts. Now, you might think that this is pretty uh, devious behaviour, and yes, it does deny the plants some of their food, However, all is not lost. The bugs are great housekeepers and prevent the buildup of excessive prey that can lead to premature leaf death. Cetochorus also defecate on the leaves of the plants, providing simple nutrients that the plants can absorb. For this reason, some people regard this relationship as somewhat symbiotic. The inevitable question is, why don't Cetochorus get trapped themselves? The reason for that is simply the numerous tiny hairs that cover their bodies and legs, which you can see in this photograph. These prevent the mucus from gripping their bodies, allowing them to plough on through the mucus without getting snared. As I mentioned, this species of Cetochorus is found only on Biblis gigantea. Biblis gigantea is endemic to the Perth region, where it was once somewhat widespread, 
but now most of its habitats lie beneath housing and car parks, and only two known locations remain. One location in a metropolitan reserve is almost extinct because the water table is being lowered uh, for housing development by the local council, making the soil too dry for them to grow. Needless to say, the extinction of such a plant as this would be all the more tragic because it would take a charismatic animal along with it. The final group of Australian carnivores is Drosera. Along with the Nepenthes, the tropical pitcher plants, it's the other carnivorous plant genus that I've mainly worked on in recent years. And, unsurprisingly, Drosera has become one of my favourite genera, and it's easy to see why. The plants are elegant, undeniably pretty, and come in a breathtaking array of different forms. These forms more or less correspond to the different groups that the genus can be divided into. Drosera are one of the most highly diversified genera in Australia in terms of their different perinating forms. The sheer range of different habitats across the continent has given rise to 15 distinct groups, each distinguished by their unique features. I don't have time to show you all of them, so I'll concentrate on the six most prominent ones in Australia. The first group is the single species of cavity-leaved sundew. This small and unassuming species, Drosera glanduligera, occurs across southern Australia, including in Melbourne suburbs. It's also the fastest moving sundew of all. Drosera tentacles are divided into three different kinds. The most dramatic are the type of three bands, the long red ones in this image, known only from this species. These bands are thigmotrophic, which means that they respond to touch, and when they are touched by insects, they dramatically end at the midsection snapping the tentacle into the cup center of the trap and taking the animal with them. The following video from YouTube is a little bit blurry, but it illustrates this point well. It's quite quick to progress. Incidentally, thank you to uh, Siegfried Hartmeier and uh, Quantum Day for these uh, videos. In the first series, you can see the hairs triggered by some forceps, but in the second, you can see fruit flies being flung into the middle of the leaf. Ah, oh, fun. <laughs> the second group of sundews is Section Arachnopus, the spider-footed sundews, so-called because of their long, spider-leggy growths. This group of 10 species is mainly found in the tropical north, with a few species creeping down into the subtropical and arid zones, including one site on the northern border of Victoria. All 10 species have the same overall form, but differ in relative proportions and flower form, but especially in terms of their glands and trichomes, as the next slide shows. These are close-up shots of the leaf axils of just four selected species. They each produce different types of distinct structure, the, the functions of which aren't conclusively known. The appendages of Drosera baratiorum are discoid and said to resemble the disc-like stalked insect eggs of some Lepidopterans, perhaps encouraging them to land. The druplet-like appendages of Drosera hartmeyerorum seem to act like tiny lenses, refracting light in the yellow spectrum, probably to attract prey. And the scrotiform appendage of Drosera fragrance, which is said to look like well, you can imagine. Um, anyway, this, this appendage is thought to act um, as an osmophore, possibly accounting for the sweet honey-like smell of this species, which certainly serves to attract prey. And finally, the barrel-like appendage of Drosera serpens seems to attract the interest of bugs, including its resident Cetochorus, but we don't yet know to what end. So there's a lot to be discovered. At this point, I should add that these sundew bugs, Cetochorus, are actually found on all groups of Australian Drosera in all states, but only two species are so far known from sundews in Australia. My colleagues and I photograph them because they're common on the plants we study, and though we've noticed huge variation, we're not entomologists. With some strategic collaboration with insect experts, it's likely that a host of new species will be described. In South America, the maggot of a fly fills a similar niche on Drosera, in Europe, the caterpillar of a moth does, so it's highly likely that similar relationships could occur in Australia if only people begin to look. The third group of Drosera is the tropical evergreen sundews of Queensland's rainforests. These three species, called the Queensland sisters, are the only true rainforest sundews. As the name of the section prolifera suggests, these plants tend to quickly form colonies. Seed set in these species is often low in the wild, and typical Drosera pollinators aren't that common in the rainforest, so they've evolved to spread vegetatively. 
Drosera schizandra, shown in this image, often produces growth from its uh, fleshy roots, while Drosera prolifera, pictured here, instead produces additional plants at the tips of its flower stems, shown in the insert, allowing it to form extensive clonal colonies. Finally, it might not surprise you to learn that glue traps don't function that well in the wet rainforest. The wet is simply not good for sticky traps, and the largest adult plants of Drosera schizandra have widely spaced glands and minimal, if any, glue production. It's thought that, as part of its rainforest specialization, that this species is evolving away from carnivory, at least in its mature phase. The fourth group is the tuberous Drosera, section Ergoleum. This is the largest single group in the genus, with about 75 species, all but two of which are Australian. The tuberous Drosera group is further divided into five additional subsections based on general morphology, including densely rosetted species to slender upright ones. The group also includes the largest of all Drosera, Drosera gigantea, which emerges in spring looking like an asparagus shoot, only to develop into a heavily branched subshrub up to a meter tall. Also pictured here is a climbing sundew which uses specialized leaves to climb two or three meters up trunks or through melaleuca scrub allowing for plenty of prey capture and maximum seed dispersal. One of the most popular subgroups in cultivation is the fan sundews, which includes a variety of basally branching species with pretty fan-like leaves. In some areas along Perth's highways, they can form especially dense colonies of plants after fires, such that the understory of the eucalyptus woodlands actually sparkles at sunset. So yes, Carnivorous plants do exhibit some elements of the macabre, but many are also extremely beautiful, having high horticultural value and also doubling up as natural pest control. Now, as the name of this group would suggest, all of these species are tuber forming, allowing them to survive in areas with extremely dry summers through dormancy. Tubers are also particularly important adaptations to survive fire, and in some species these tubers may be found nearly a meter below the soil surface. What is particularly handy about these tubers is that many species produce their tubers within the same sheath. As a result, they form annual layers functionally equivalent to tree rings. To this end, we've actually been able to age tuberous Drosera, with some of the oldest tubers exceeding 50 years, making them perhaps some of the most long-lived of all carnivorous plants. The fifth group is the Pygmy Drosera, a group of about 60 mostly summer dormant species, so-called because they are tiny. The white grains in this image of Drosera pycnoblaster are quartz sand, not pebbles, which uh, makes these particular rosettes half the diameter of an Australian five-cent coin, so truly tiny. Conversely, the largest pygmy Drosera have rosettes about the size of a 10-cent piece. What pygmy Drosera lack in terms of plant size, they more than make up for in their flowers, many of which are larger than those of the other larger Australian Drosera. Many pygmy Drosera flowers are bug pollinated, and they're often correspondingly large, gaudy affairs with contrasting centers that attract really picky pollinators. In fact, sometimes the easiest way to spot a pygmy sundew is to look for its flowers, which can form large drifts on the ground. So, besides their stunning flowers, what makes pygmy Drosera more interesting than the tantalizingly diverse tuberous sundews? The first thing is how they survive as perennial plants over the harsh Australian summer without shriveling to dust. The answer is these large stipule buds shown here near the start of summer dormancy. These stipules are reflective and insulating, forming tight buds that protect the plants from intense sun and dehydration. They're clearly effective as they allow some of the tiniest perennial plants on the continent to successfully aestivate, that is, sleep over the summer. Another thing that many species do is to form tall columnar growths, as on the left, or stilt roots, as on the right. Both growth forms lift the delicate growing tip of the plants away from the surface of the soil, which can heat to over 60 degrees Celsius on the hottest days of summer in Australia. This decreases the likelihood of lethal desiccation during their summer dormancy. And finally, pygmy sundews produce gemi. Gemi are tiny, modified leaves bearing embryonic plants and roots, and they are capable of producing new plants very quickly. They form densely in the center of each rosette at the start of the winter growing season, pushing out against the surrounding stipule bud, creating an unstable state of tension. All it takes is a well-placed raindrop to break this tension, and the stipules recoil, sending the gemi flying in all directions, sometimes meters from the parent. They allow these tiny plants to effectively colonize habitat each growing season. 
The pygmies also include several of the rarest carnivorous plants in Australia. This is one of them, Drosera oreopodion, known from a Perth railway reserve in a single patch smaller than this stage, so about 20 square metres. It was discovered long after the Perth suburb it's found in was developed, and today this lonesome species is threatened by horribly trivial things like dog mess, picnics and illegal garbage tipping, not to mention the more general threat of a drying climate. In a region where 97% of natural vegetation has already been destroyed, habitat clearance and fragmentation imperil far more many species than just this one. The final Drosera group is the woolly sundews, a group of tropical summer dormant species from the savannas of northern Australia. This group of 15 species is adapted to hot, dry summers and hot, wet winters. As such, they tolerate both drought and fire, as well as the intense heat and fierce sunlight of the tropical north. Like the tuberous sundews, they come in a range of forms, including a few annuals, but most, especially the rosetted forms, are able to perinate from year to year. Some, like Drosera falconeri, retreat to a swollen bulb of thickened leaf bases just below the surface of the ground for summer. Most others, like Drosera dilatatio petiolaris, have different summer and winter leaves. Shown here are the winter leaves, but those of the summer are altogether different, being covered in dense white hair. The extent of this hair can be seen in this section through a dormant sister species, Drosera lanata. The white hair serves to reflect the extremely intense summer sunlight, diffusing any light that does penetrate to the still living growth point. The dense layer of hair also acts as insulation and guards against temperature fluctuations between the cool nights and very hot days, reducing transpiration and thus demand for water. Even more awesome, in the dry season, night temperatures fall low enough to result in dew formation on the woolly hairs. These droplets of dew coalesce and trickle down to the roots, providing just enough moisture to keep the plants ticking over until the rainy season arrives. Now, I'm running out of time here, so just one more point about these awesome hairs. The habitats these plants live in typically experience fires every 5 to 25 years. Sitting on the surface of the soil, you'd think that these plants would be goners, except that the hair also serves as a fire blanket. The coating of white hairs is actually so dense that it offers resistance to quick-moving cool-burn wildfires that periodically sweep through the savannas. The mats of hair are so dense that they trap cooler air around the dormant plant, preventing the death of the growing point, while the outermost leaves and the tips of the hairs are sacrificed to the flames. All in all, an extraordinary adaptation. And with that, I'd like to bring this talk to a close, with the hope that you've learnt a little bit more about these amazing plants. They include some of the most fascinating and imperiled plant species in Australia, and while it's easy to fixate on their sometimes over-dramatized bloodlust, hopefully you can now see that there is far more to them than mere curiosity value. I'd like to extend my thanks to colleagues and friends who filled several uh, Im image gaps for me, particularly uh, Greg Burke at Mount Tomar, uh, those at Curtin and Adelaide Universities, and also Munich Herbarium, as well as several other experts further afield. Finally, thank you to you all for listening.